Market itself has opened with about a 70 point uplift on the headline index and as of now the bank nifty is also in step with a gain of about two tenths of a percent. So LNT, SBI, lots of your heavyweights up and about. Uh, some names like Hindalco from the Metals Universe doing okay. SBI is up. Uh, some of the tech names also on the upside of the screen. Very diverse sort of a broad up move. Uh, speaking of the decliners, not too many names actually. Dr. Eddie's Britannia, Nestle. So basically, it seems that FMCG Pharma not so much in focus, but the rest of the market is looking good as we start off 70 points higher. Well, the mid-cap index is outperforming for another day in a row. The mid-cap index is up half a percent and today the advanced decline ratio is positive, skewed in favour of the advancing side. So we've got about 1250 stocks in the green at open versus about 350 stocks in the red. On the way down, CDSL, Aster DM down 5, 5.5%. The street is awaiting that block deal on both these stocks. Uh, so under pressure, Snowman Logistics, a stock that Nigel highlighted in the morning, is one of the big winners of the day. 7% up on that. The promoters, remember, have been increasing their stake in the company. Uh, so that's up nearly 7%. ABB India starts the day with a gain of about 4%, so strong opening there. Uh, you've got uh, Pratap Snacks and Sanofi India as a couple of the other winners in the mid-cap uh, universe. Other than that, um, you know, you've got um, strength coming in on PTC India, Sham Metallics. We will be chatting with the management. Nosil too, uh, on, you know, compared to what the kind of volumes we normally see, Nosil is you know, popping up on the price and on the volume charts. Uh, so that stock is up 3.5%. Well, that's right, Reema. A few more stocks to add to the list. You have Gravita. Kotak had initiated coverage on the stock. Uh, you know, the stock is reacting positively. Yesterday, it ended at the high point of the day. Today, it's seeing follow-through up close to around 3%. A few more stocks... Uh, that are catching my attention. Map My India is down close to around 5.5%, so keep an eye out on that one. That's one of the bigger losers, actually, in today's trading session, so that stock is on our radar. Torrent Power yesterday ended with a massive gain. Well, that one's coming for some profit-taking uh, as well after the big upsurge. Let's see whether or not that dip gets bought into. And as I mentioned earlier today, that Snowman Logistics, yesterday it crossed a couple of crucial technical levels. Now it's trading comfortably above the 20 as well as the 50 DMA, so let's see if it can hold on to that mark. But uh, those are the top stocks actually that are moving around. Let's add to the list a couple of uh, more movers. Indus Stars has had a one-way move. Now that one has come in for some profit taking, so just keep an eye out on that one. It started off in the green and came back down. And SCI Land and Assets, you know, the stock was at lower circuit for the last few sessions. Today it's opened it up a circuit with the gain of close around 5%. So that one as well is on our radar. What else will be? Uh, I'm just looking at ABB because this uh, you know brokerage call. Uh, has worked very, very well. It's UBS and UBS's price target on ABB is now northwards of 7,500. Stocks reacting very well to that. Uh, UBS is, uh, you know, saying that electrification and motion will drive growth, uh, growth and margins, and uh, you can expect more upgrades. So that's one stock in focus, uh, looking good. Uh, other than that, uh, some of the names that Mangalam alerted us on, Pratap Snacks, for instance, which is uh, launching. Uh, fresh, I think this commissioning of a fresh, uh, you know, uh, line, a facility line, uh, that's working well. 4% up on that stock as well. Uh, CDSL, of course, in focus because of the block deal. 6% down on that one. Uh, ditto for Aster, still down about 55 6%. So that's how it's playing out. But the broader market's actually uh, the one where the action is. The uh, mid-cap index is up about half a percent. Uh, looking good. A lot of those PSU names. By the way, Zomato, check out the move on Zomato. Now 3.5%. Yeah. And, and this follows after yesterday's big surge. Zomato is going places. Maybe it's IPL season, maybe it's something else. The stock has been on a roll. Zomato, one year is 276% of a rally. And this year alone, Zomato has put on 52%. So, yeah, going's been good for uh, this one stock. Mankind still looking good, 3, 3.5% three up. Uh, so, lots of names. And then you have, of course, the railway stocks, IRFC, Rights, a lot of these names uh, on the upside of the screen. Well, that's right. Mankind, the reason the stock is moving up is post that clean-out trade that we saw yesterday from the PE. Uh, the optimism is that it gets into the MSCI going by a couple of notes. And that's why the stock from yesterday's low, in fact, is up close to around 7.5%. So that's been one of the big movers. I think one of the blocks got cleaned out uh, and that was splashing for us on the screen. It'll come back up for our viewers as well. So we'll keep an eye out on that. But a good time to get in. Gautam Shah, founder and chief strategist, Goldilocks Premium Research, who joins us on the show. Hi, Gautam. Always good to have you on the show. The market's in a bit of a lull, year-end phenomena maybe. We get a fresh trend from April. But how do you see the headline index shape up? The Nifty and the Nifty Bank. Well, good morning. I think make no mistake, this market has been in consolidation for, uh, phase for almost three months now. You know, we started the new year at a level of 20, 21,800. And as we speak, we are at 21, 22,000. So three months have passed 
and the Nifty continues to be around the same level. I think uh, ditto for the bank Nifty. So clearly, this is a very healthy pause that the markets have seen after the kind of run-up that we saw in November and December of last year. And there has been divergent moves on the indices and in, in the market in general, because the top 300 stocks seem to be going through a time correction, whereas anything lower, you know, the balance 1500 stocks seem to have gone through a 15% correction collectively. So if you actually study the market breadth, this market has seen a very large uh, correction internally, which does not show up on the technical studies. But I do believe that this consolidation is healthy and this is going to continue for some more time. I think the range is very clear in the form of 21,850 on the downside and 22,250 on the upside. Until we actually don't move past this zone, I don't think you're going to see anything special. So it's, it's almost like a pendulum with a few good days, a few bad days. And I think this is going to continue. But this is still a very theme-specific, sector-specific, stock-specific market. The medium-term, long-term bull trend continues. The liquidity factor remains. India's All of India's positives remains. It's just that this pause needs a little more time to resolve itself before we can start turning up again. Mm. Uh, Gautam, hi. Good morning. Good to have you on the show as always. So if indeed uh, the Nifty is going to punch through this broad consolidation, 500, 600 point consolidation, then uh, which are the heavy hitters? Because none of them are consistently adding up. Uh, you, know, you know, one week it's Reliance, the other week is a little bit of a flare up in IT. Banks continue to sulk barring the odd, you know, one odd good day. So where are the heavy hitters? Uh, that's quite true, Surabhi, because you don't have too many uh, stocks that are leading this market higher, which has been the problem in the last couple of weeks. You know, in the month of December, you had a scenario wherein all the three big boys, IT, Reliance and Banks, did well. And that's probably the reason the Nifty gradually moved to levels of 22,000 and beyond. Now, if you look at the last one month, what you'll realize is that it's just the burden on Reliance, you know, to keep this market safe. And that stock continues to trade around 2,900. But banks have come off in the last 15 days and SDFC does not perform, does not outperform. And that's not helping the entire market. And the IT index in the last one week, I think the move has been quite discouraging. So given this setup and given the fact that you don't have too many big boys batting for the bulls, I, I don't think it's going to be easy for the markets to actually get past that 22,250 number. So I think we are going to stay in this range for some time. Uh, and the bigger opportunity could be in the small caps and mid caps because that's where the big fall happened. And that's where I think things could have stabilized. Uh, so those 1,500 stocks, you know, you started off the conversation by breaking the market into the top 300 stocks, which are in a range and consolidating, and the bottom 1,500 or, you know, the X of those 300 stocks, where we have seen a price correction of about 15, 20%. You believe that is done? And what is the opportunity? Can you name some stocks where you think perhaps we've put in a bottom and there is upside from here? Uh, Rima, it's actually quite unique that the market does, uh, you know, things which are completely out of the box because you have a 2% correction on the Nifty and you have a 12% correction on the small cap index. I mean, that's the kind of uh, disconnect that we've seen in the recent past. But as I said, if you really run through a set of, say, 500, 700 stocks, you'll see that most of them have lost anywhere between 20 to 40%. So I think the cleanup has happened and you had a scenario where grade C and grade D stocks had started to do well and, and were being justified at any price. That that phase is gone. The men have been separated from the boys. And I think quality mid caps and quality small caps will come back strongly. I mean, I don't want to give you names here, but some of the auto ancillary names, some of the stocks in the hotel space, uh, you know, some of the infra stocks, I think they all look very good. But in terms of overall sectors, I think our preference remains in the form of pharma and, and uh, metals. I think these are the two spaces which we feel could outperform over the next three to six months. Okay, all right. In metals, you want to share any names or you want to split it up between ferrous, non ferrous? Uh, I would actually go with the entire space because the way the charts are, I do see a 20% move on the metals index over the next uh, 6 to 12 months. So that's sizable. And within the metal space, I think the two PSUs which really stand out for us are Nalco and Sale. And I think both these stocks have the potential to register super normal gains this year. Okay, Nalco and Sale. One would have thought fundamentally they're hitting the upper end of. Uh, or, you know, the range in terms of valuations. But uh, technically, things are looking up. Uh, noted your point, Gautam. Let's talk about, you know, you said let's separate the men from the boys. Well, part of the men, one group of them is the IT stocks. And you have negative news flow coming in on, on the fundamental front. How do you think that index is shaping up? And if any ideas out there? 
Yeah, I think I have been optimistic all along. You know, for the last six months, I've always been a big bull on the IT space. But with what has happened in the last one week, I'm a little concerned because there is this big debate in the in the world and in the market space right now is whether AI is really going to disrupt the uh, IT space in general and the Indian IT services space. I mean, that's the big debate which I I, I like to you know uh, talk to when I speak to clients. And given what has happened in the last one week, I feel that the leadership is gone to some extent. I still like the big names, so I think TCS, HCL Tech uh, remain on top of our list. And I feel whatever the market scenario, you want to be invested in them. But mid-cap IT could be in a slightly difficult space because they were always very richly valued and they were too much discounted to the future, you know, in terms of all the positives. So apart from the top two or three names, I want to stay away for the, uh, from the IT space just for a bit till things stabilize. Hmm. Gautam, uh, what are uh, US charts telling you? I mean, it's been a phenomenal one-way rally there. It's only paused in the last two, three sessions. But uh, what, do, what do those charts of maybe the yields, what do they indicate? Is the, is the bull run on? Well, firstly, there is too much happening on the intermarket stuff. Because if you look at oil, I think it's setting up for a large rally is what it looks like. Uh, gold and silver have done very well. And I have made this point multiple times that uh, gold is going to be the trade of 2024. So that remains. And I do see levels of 2,500 to even 2,700 on gold. So you want to be uh, committed there. And the dollar index is also you know, at a point from where you could see a little bit of a bump up. So given all of these factors, I think if you go back to equities, last week, the stance of the Fed, I think basically energized the bulls in the US. But you know, you can't have an environment where the top 10 stocks keep taking the US market higher because even in the US, the breath is a bit of a problem. So I think the US markets are going to take a bit of a breather. There could even be a 3 to 5% kind of a correction. And if that happens, it could impact world equity markets, including India. Because, you know, so far, India and US have completely moved hand in hand, but it's not happened in the last one month. There has been some underperformance despite the 19,000 crores coming into the system every single month. So there are some issues. One should not, uh, you know, uh, paint this with a very rosy picture. I think this is healthy consolidation. U.S. could also see some correction. Be prepared for that. Mm. What about crude? Is there a risk crude might flare up? I think there's a very big risk because right now when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, risks in the world of financial markets. I think pretty much elections is a non-event as you know, when you speak to anybody. But crude, given what it's done in the last one, one and a half months, I get the feeling that NYMEX crude is gradually moving towards the level of $90, $95. I think people are not factoring that in. But if that were to happen, definitely there could be uh, you know, some dynamics that could change and people could then start you know, using crude as an excuse to justify this consolidation or underperformance that India has seen. So yes, there are some near-term risks, but again, it's really a battle between short-term to long-term. You know, short-term, there are concerns. Medium-term, long-term, this is a great opportunity to do your homework and pick quality stocks you know, to play the next wave up. Mm, you know, since it's so positive, Gautam, on uh, metals, I wanted your view on copper. You know, over here, Hindustan copper, fundamentally, things look stretched. But the key trigger is if copper prices are going to move up from here, that's the only pure play copper uh, play here in India. Uh, so how would you play it? I mean, what are the levels you're looking at on copper itself? See, when you talk about metals, you have to look at the China factor. And what I'm told is that uh, the return of China in some sense, I think, could be responsible for what happens to the world going forward and what happens to the metal space. I mean, I'm not a fundamental analyst. I, go, I don't go into this in detail, but my analysts tell yes. me that that could be an important factor. And Hindustan Copper, as you rightly said, I think it's it's a, pro, a pure play, a copper play. And I think there is a lot more to come. See, please understand stocks like Nalco, Sale, Hindustan Copper have been underperformers or non-performers for years and now they are finding their footing you know what happened to many of the psu stocks they did nothing for about seven eight years and when the trend picked up you don't start looking at valuations immediately so i think they're going to be stretched and if the china comeback does happen which is what it looks like then i think metal stocks could be beneficiaries as they say right for everything else you look at fundamentals for <laughs> metals you look at momentum yeah. And mm. some of these stocks have the momentum. And it's interesting, you know, he's saying that metals will do well and pharma will do well. Traditionally, these are sectors that are completely opposite yeah. to each other. Pharma is more defensive in nature and metals, metals are all about risk. And, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, global so what risk about on. the pharma index upside? On metals, you believe there is a 20% upside on the metal index over the next 6 to 12 months. On pharma, what would your levels be and your big bets? 
Well, Rima, firstly, I think uh, nothing that the market has done in the recent past is out of the textbooks. You know, otherwise you would not have seen the small cap index fall 12% and the internal market sees such a large correction and the indices are steady because I think sticky money is going into the top 300 top quality stocks. And that's probably the reason every time there is a dip in the, you know, top stocks, there is buying interest. And I think this is this trend is going to stay over the next six to 12 months. But talking about pharma, I think some of the stocks are doing so well. I think I'm expecting a 15% move on the pharma index even from here. Sun Pharma remains our top pick. Uh, you know, we, we've been covering this for a while now. Cipla, Dr. Reddy's, Zydus Life, all have great charts and I think will continue to outperform. Okay, so those are uh, some of the metal names to wrap things up then. Uh, Gautam, since you mentioned, uh, look beyond the index, look at quality mid caps. You named some sectors, but you know any interesting names, any charts that are coming up for you that you'd like to leave us with within the you know, large mid caps? Well, I think I like to play themes. So I think in hotels, if you look at Indian hotels, it's been our favorite uh, for a while now. If you have to play railway, I would still go with an IRCTC. I think that's a big opportunity. If you look at aviation, I think Indigo has been doing really well. And it was a stock which was always due for a big rally. Yesterday was a big move, and I think this is going to continue. So some of these really top quality themes also add chemicals to it. I think we are reaching a point where the chemicals index could potentially see a breakout on the upside so stocks like arti industries you know srf could be potential beneficiaries so we are focusing on all those stocks which have been in consolidation and are now starting to do well okay all right uh, good to see you in gautam thanks a lot for joining in and giving us your take on a whole host of those sectors as well as on the index wishing you a good day ahead well time to focus on our uh, next corporate then sharp metallics we have with us with a uh, Shitej Agarwal, the whole time director who joins us on the show. Um, hi, good morning, uh, Shitej, and thanks so much uh, for joining in. Well, we've got a couple of news points that have come in. One is with regard to the composite license for the iron ore mine in Maharashtra. And the other point is the foray into aluminum FRP. Could you give us a few more details with regard uh, to the aluminum part of the business? Uh, you know, you're forayed into the greenfield, uh, greenfield expansion of aluminum roll products. So you're allocating close to around 450 crores. By when do we see revenues come out and what is the asset turn on this investment? Uh, good morning, Nigel. Thank you for having me on the show. Thanks. So, uh, as uh, you know, we are already aware, we are operating uh, two large aluminum foil rolling units in Kolkata uh, and also one in uh, Jharkhand. Uh, what we aim to do is to backward integrate uh, and put up a caster CRM facility with an investment of 450 crores. Which will, which will enable us to have complete raw material security and also uh, thereby make use of the conducive EBITDA enhancement that would come as a result of that. Uh, the balance part of this portfolio would cater to uh, industries such as the automotive sector, where we would be manufacturing automotive heat shields, uh, the air conditioning sector, where we will be manufacturing uh, AC Finstock that goes into air conditioners. Uh, Apart from this, the, uh, on the uh, green energy side, we have already forayed into the manufacture of battery foil. This is a crucial component that goes into uh, the cathode conductor of lithium ion batteries. Looking at the uh, EV boom that would come up in India in the next couple of years, uh, we will be able to uh, not only make the finished product in terms of battery foil, but now we would also have the capability of manufacturing the raw material in terms of battery grade foil stock, uh, thus being completely integrated and making a make in India product. Okay, all right, Shitej, you've given us some part of that rationale. Let's get a couple of numbers going then. You said that this particular expenditure will help in backward integration. So what could the cost benefit be then? You know, as of now, how much do you spend? And post the commissioning of this unit, what does it come down to? Right. So I, I, I am not at liberty to uh, discuss with you an exact per ton figure, but I could give you a rough idea. Uh, foil stock is uh, currently comprises of 85% of the entire uh, COGS in the manufacture of foil. This would come down to approximately 75% once we have our own unit in place. So that's that's one of an additional benefit that we would uh, garner from here. Uh, the other aspect would be reduction in lead times, uh, reduction in uh, the 
import forecasts. So we will not be reliant on the imports. We will be able to manufacture our own raw material and ship it to the plant facility in the within the period of a day. So there will be considerable savings on the working capital cycle as well. Interesting. Okay. All right. And by when do we see this unit getting commissioned? We'll just finish this part of it and then we'll focus on the iron block. Absolutely. Uh, so we believe that we will be able to commission the unit two years from now. We are already at an advanced stage of all statutory clearances. The land is under our possession. Uh, so we believe that we would hit commercialization in exactly two years from now. Commercialization two years from now. And 450 crores is the total quantum, right? Uh, you'll be funding it via debt, internal accruals. What will it be? The project will be funded majorly by internal accruals. However, we will make use of uh, equipment financing owing to the low level of interest that we could garner. Mm. And just to complete this point, I mean, while you said you can't uh, share, uh, you know, margin sort of projections with us at this point in time, you're in, I mean, in this stage, you're investing 450 crores. Uh, what is the commissioning timeline? And just from a revenue mix perspective, how much will uh, this new line uh, add to the top line? We will be adding approximately 1,200 crores to the top line conservatively. Uh, and the unit, as I said, would hit commercialization in 2026. So there would be a slow ramp up process. But by year two to year three, we believe that we will hit the 1,200 crore revenue mark. And overall, it's going to be, I mean, while you're not sharing exact spreads and margins, but overall, is it ballpark similar to your core business? Or could it actually be margin accretive, uh, given that it's this is EV, it's a lot of these, this is, you know, uh, sunrise sectors it, it's going to be uh, it's going to have a much more uh, enhanced and conducive margin going forward uh, because currently uh, there are just a few raw material suppliers in india uh, and they command a hefty premium over the raw material for this product uh, right so us being able to manufacture this would definitely add uh, to a significant bottom line going ahead uh, other than this, uh, it would also enable us to uh, drive significant volumes in the market. Uh, so there would be a, a volume uptake on the foil side, that is the finished product side as well. Okay. Uh, moving on then to the composite license that you've received for the Surjagad Iron Ore Block. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this composite license? How much is the investment that you plan to make? And you have about a 49% uh, holding in this block. So your contribution will be restricted to that amount? Uh, yes. So uh, recently we got the composite mining license for the Surjagar iron ore mine. This is located in Orissa. Uh, it's got very high grade iron ore. And uh, we believe that, uh, you know, setting up the entire iron ore block and hitting commercialization would take approximately three years from today. Uh, and investment size for restarting the block would be somewhere close to uh, 2,000 crores, we believe. And uh, sort of then what, what's the potential, revenue potential? Uh, do you have buyers already tied up? You know, by when does the ore get mined? As in, when does it get uh, sort of operational? When do you bring it to the market and who are the buyers? And this two, for potential 2,000 crores of investment, mm. uh, how much of it does Sham Metallics have to put in? I think the other 51% is with the Sarda group. Correct. So, uh, so the investment that would go into the mine would be proportional of the holding of the company. And at the same time, in terms of uh, off takers, this is predominantly for our own captive consumption. So by having, having the mine would enable us to uh, secure a resource in terms of backward integration to the mine end and also evaluate future opportunities in terms of establishment of a plant near that geography. Uh, so this 2,000 crores will be from the Sham Metallics group? Uh, no. So 2000, That's a so, total investment. Uh, it's a total yes. investment, 1,000 crores each approximately. Yes, that's what we foresee at the moment. All right. And what kind of mining capacity do you all look at, say, after three years, you know, in the initial years, what will it be? How many million tons will it be? And what is the cost benefit then, since, again, this would be backward integration? Right. So I think it's it's difficult to sort of estimate a cost benefit at the moment, uh, as you understand that the mines go on auction premiums. So the mm. so the the auction price is dependent on the IBM forecast. Uh, so yes. it's difficult to give you an off the hand uh, figure at the moment. 
You know, you know why I'm asking you this, Sitesh, is because I think uh, the you know the group, the JV, submitted a final offer price of around 125 percent. At times, I've seen in the past when that premium is so high, sometimes groups say that we rather not mind because you know, anyways, I know prices have come down and maybe it'll be more economical to buy from the open market. Uh, give us your rationale. Uh, so, so Nigel. You know, going forward, natural resources are getting more and more scarce. And mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, have a frontline play on steel, especially for a company like us, which is end-to-end -end integrated, right? So we yes. don't only enjoy the margin from intermediates, but more than 50% of our portfolio is actually for finished goods. It's important for us to secure a resource in terms of, uh, you know, our raw material security. Sure. Uh, while the index prices, uh, you know, are relative, they might move upwards or downwards. We always have the opportunity of building up that margin in terms of the value chain, right? Which we so, already so, present. So, 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 the, so just to understand this, the focus more is on securing yourself with regard to raw materials. It may not be, a, you know, a big cost benefit. That time will tell. But as of now, at least you're securing yourself with regard to raw, raw, uh, raw material availability, right? Absolutely. Shritij, how are you funding the 1,000 crores that you need to put into this mine? This would be funded majorly through internal accruals. Okay, so no need for any additional uh, capital raising? So, so, yes, the funding would have been over three years of time, which would be major, majorly. Okay, through. so, you know, since we've discussed, uh, you know, uh, the new aluminum line independently, we've discussed this mine. Let's just, you know, talk big picture as well. Year is almost rounding up. Uh, you know, how do you see things play out in the fourth quarter just in terms of uh, how the overall margin profile is moving? and? Uh, what's the outlook as we get into the new year? Absolutely. So uh, the fourth uh, the fourth quarter has uh, you know the seasonal demand is sort of a catalyst every fourth quarter. So we will see some strong uh, volume growth as compared to the previous quarter. Uh, also, going into the next quarter, we are heading into the election year. So we will see government spending uh, slowing down and uh, thereby infrastructure projects might uh, take a temporary slowdown for the next couple of months. This might impact the demand for finished steel, especially on the construction side. However, in line with the government's vision to produce 300 million tons of steel by 2030, we believe that new projects will be announced once the new government is formed and uh, we will be able to take, up it, up, take it up from there. Trying to get in two numbers now, Satish, if you can help us out with that, what kind of volume growth will you all be looking at or the absolute volume number for FI25, given take the remount in demand in the second half and given take the small, the slowdown in the first half, what kind of a volume number and the blended EBITDA per ton is something that you'll normally share in your presentations. Give us a broad range on that as well. Uh, so, uh, Nigel, most of our capacities that we had uh, started in FI2324 have now hit uh, full capacity utilization in terms of the finished steel side. I can uh, project a volume growth for the next year at a rate of 20 to 22%. Apart okay. from this, we are also adding further finished steel capacity on the cold rolling mill side, which is also a much value added product. And yes. uh, this would uh, sort of be to a tune of uh, 0.2 million tons for the next mm -hmm. financial year. Uh, so I think that's a broad uh, view on the finished goods side. Uh, on the intermediate side, a lot of our CapEx projects are going to come live in 24-25. This would enable us to uh, project a more conducive EBITDA going forward, gain from there. So what would that number be then? You have been in the vicinity of six to around 6,500, blended EBITDA per ton. How I'm, much I'm, higher does it go? I'm not at liberty to uh, discuss, but uh, definitely there are a lot of synergies to be created from the backward so integration projects coming live. So fair to say that the EBITDA per ton will be better in FI25 in comparison to FI24? Yeah, we hope so, considering okay. that, uh, considering that uh, we resume back after the election year and yes. uh, projects go in full swing as they were in the last year. Right. That is the focus. Okay, final question then. Uh, you know, we have gone on for a goodish bit, but I don't want you to break up the CAPEX, you know, that you're doing because you're doing plenty of it. But give us one number. What is the pending CAPEX plan that you have? 
and what is the peak net debt level that we should be looking at? Right. Uh, so currently we have a pen pending capex of approximately 5,000 crores, which goes into 27, 28. So we have approximately over three years to complete this capex. Uh, we have already commissioned uh, capexes worth uh, 3,000 crores from in the last three years. And uh, we believe that 24, 25, we will be accruing a further capex of 2000 crores which may which with major of the capex outlay coming live in the second quarter of the year peak debt levels would be peak debt levels satish yes so uh, currently we are standing at a debt level of 1800 crores and we believe that we will maintain this debt level going forward it's been good speaking to you, Sudesh. Thanks so much for joining in and, in fact, fielding all those questions. So we've got some color on your aluminum, uh, you know, FRP plans, on your iron ore mine, as well as the business on the whole. It's been a while since you'll join on CNBC TV 18. Looking forward to chatting up with you all rather soon. For the time being, though, we'll slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by the promoter entity of MTAR Technologies. You stay with us. And it's that big charge from Reliance, uh, which is taking the market up, up and away. 100 points on the Nifty, 110 actually. And look at the big move on this one. 2.5% uh, higher. The morning note, I think, was a UBS note, which in bull case was speaking about levels of over 3,400 on the stock. Uh, actually, over 4,000, if I remember correctly. I think the bull, the the bull case, was case is 3,400. And I think the bull case is closer, closer to 4,500. 4, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> so, so, so one part of the market is uh, come to life. That is Reliance Industries, which has really been, uh, you know, the go-to stock for the bulls. Mm -hmm. The other part is the Nifty Bank. Yeah. It's currently around 150 points away from those crucial levels. If the Nifty Bank can get closer to around that 47,000 mark and break that, we'll have a fantastic close to FY24, you know, so let's mm. see if that happens. We have got today and tomorrow, and we have got that expiry-related factor as well. So one batsman is performing, over to the other one, the Nifty Bank. <laughs> let's see if it can chip in as well. Well, uh, on that note, uh, let's get you uh, some uh, important viewpoints, and this is an exclu exclusive conversation uh, that we had with Consumer Affairs Secretary Rohit Kumar Singh, who's uh, told us that surrogate advertising is not permitted for alcohol and tobacco products. Our colleague Timsi Jaipuri caught up with uh, Mr. Singh and spoke on topics like the insurance sector, restaurant service charges, and a lot more. Take a look. Surrogate advertising is a way where uh, the uh, industry like alcohol and tobacco they try and circumvent the advertising regulation uh, whether it is banned and they try and you know use it as a extension of brand extension so like there'll be an alcohol uh, brand this will sell glasses with the same brand name so that is not permitted and we engaged with the industry uh, in mumbai and also in delhi and we said no you cannot do this and we also have guide set of guidelines ready and uh, we've also asked them that Suppose sometimes they come with an excuse that, you know, I'm not selling this alcohol, but I'm just selling a glass or a soda water or a CD or drinking uh, water, uh, the mineral water. So we say, no, you have to give us detail. And uh, CCPA, which I chair now, has just issued an order about a week back that they have to give us the, the value of the advertising mm -hmm. on the extended brand vis-a-vis -vis the actual revenue they get from the sales mm -hmm. because 
any uh, normal business practice will have you advertise in proportion of the revenues of that product. Mm. So if it is out of proportion, that means the surrogate advertising is being indulged into and that's an unfair trading practice. When it comes to healthcare treatments and the charges, Consumer Affairs Department has been writing to both Health Ministry, Ayush Ministry, etc. And also when it comes to NCDRCs, a lot of judgments have come in the recent past where healthcare treatment charges were found to be unfair, the treatments were found to be unfair. Uh, how to regulate this space? Because now Supreme Court is also hearing this matter. They've asked Health Ministry to do a stakeholders consultation with states and come with a sort of a basic ruling where uh, there are certain set standards across the country for treatments. There should be some basic minimum charges and that's what to be charged and they should be same across the country. Since consumers are involved here, uh, what is your view? I'm sure you are also a stakeholder here. Yes, we are concerned when it comes to unfair practices. So if there is an unfair medical practice, then people can come to consumer commissions and consumer courts and they have been coming. Let me give you a statistics. Out of the 5,40,000 cases that India has in its consumer courts at all the three levels, national, state and districts, one third pertain to insurance. 1,60,000 cases pertain to insurance. Maybe there is some systemic changes that are required because otherwise why will so many people come to courts? And things are happening. There are many good judgments by Honorable Supreme Court and NCDRC. And the, uh, this thing is getting structured. But uh, as you said, in medical negligence versus, not versus, and medical insurance, there is still a lot of work to be done. For example, one of our colleague uh, presidents from Punjab, uh, the lady once told me that when you buy travel insurance, when you're mm -hmm. traveling and mm -hmm. suddenly the travel agent says, sir, this could be travel mm -hmm. insurance. What exactly is covered in that travel insurance which you're buying with your air ticket, especially if you're traveling mm -hmm. overseas? Mm -hmm. The consumer is not clear as to what is covered, what is not covered. So we need to have uh, a separate regulation for that. Another thing which President NCDRC brought to our notice is uh, a medical insurance is only applicable when you are treated as an inpatient. With the advancement of technology, now there are many procedures which can be done in six, seven hours and you can go home. I'll give you an example, gallbladder removal. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this uh, the thing which happens in eye, I'm forgetting the name, uh, mm -hmm. the surgery. Mm -hmm. So it happens and, and you can go home in six, seven Cataract. hours. Cataract. Right. So uh, now you are in hospital less than 24 hours. So are you not, uh, is it not admissible for medical insurance? So I think they have had judgment and we also wrote to IRDAI and the finance ministry that all these aspects, because everything is evolving. So we need to keep changes so that consumer is adequately protected. I think IRDI is working that uh, is working it should on be right. only for a limited number of hours and post that right. the insurance claims can be right. initiated. Ex exactly. People are anxiously waiting that they should not be allowed to pay service charges. It should be voluntary and not mandatory. Exactly. A tussle is going on between the restaurants and the department in the court. Where are we? How soon do we see a judgment or a resolution here? And will it be in the favor of the consumers? So there is no tussle here. We are just fighting for the right of the consumers, the consumers who go and eat in the restaurants. So we are saying, we have the firm belief that service charge is like a gratuity or a hmm. tip. And it cannot be forced upon. Only when you are happy with the service, you pay the tip. So, uh, and all that argument about, you know, paying the waiters out of that kitty, is not a logical argument because we are saying, okay, if you want to do that, you increase the price on the menu. Hmm. But don't disguise the charges. Don't fool the consumer. That's the fundamental principle. So when the bill comes, it says taxes, of course, everybody has hmm. to pay. And then it says SC, hmm. service charge. Half of people don't know what is SC. And you are there with your family and guests, your boyfriend or girlfriend. And now you don't want to fight there in front of the... Uh, your uh, you know esteemed guest there and then uh, you know you uh, that is being forced upon you and even the percentage is different 
somebody will charge 5 somebody will say 10 somebody will say 12 so this is not done you know you have to tell the just by putting it in the window that this restaurant charges service charges it does not you cannot you know it's like uh, saying for any you enter this mall and you only charge 50 rupees are bhai why because any charge has to be justified so uh, and this argument that uh, you pay uh, waiters extra of that mm, kitty mm. is not if i have to pay waiter extra i will pay part of the gratuity or kitty so uh, it's there in the court and i think one more hearing it will be sorted out hopefully in favor of the consumer of this country Interesting chat there. That's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. But back to corporate conversation. And the company on our radar right now is MTAR Technology. Now, uh, the company reported the Q3 numbers about a month and a half back. And at that time, they said that revenues in FI24 shall be marginally higher compared to FI23 due to a deferment of export shipments in clean energy sector to the next year. And therefore, for FI25, the company is quite confident about growth and they're guiding for a 45 to 50 percent increase in revenues. The company also went on to say that they are in the final stages of discussions with reputed global MNCs and they've also made good progress in small satellite launch vehicle project. Parva Srinivas Reddy, MD and promoter of MTAR, is with us on the show now. Uh, Mr. D, you know, morning, this is Rima here. Um, you know, the commentary that I just read out was shared by you about a month and a half back that FI24 will see slight increase revenue, FI25 will see 25 to 50%. There are deferments in export shipments. On track, in the last one and a half months, what has changed? Uh, are further orders being deferred or have you managed to get, you know, that streamlined? Yeah, we have managed to streamline everything. Uh, if you look at our FI23, uh, we did 322 crores and FI24, we did 575. Uh, one thing is, we, in, in spite of the deferment of shipments, we were able to sustain such similar revenue uh, for this current year, more or less. And then uh, the next year, the growth story remains intact. And uh, as you said, uh, we have signed enough. Uh, uh, you know, we are, we are progressing very well with number of MNCs to uh, work on long-term contracts with them which should be more or less finalized within the next one, one and a half months or so, a couple of months. So we are we are on track with uh, what we need to do about this and uh, uh, we would continue to grow the way we're supposed to grow moving forward as well. Just to reiterate, Mr. Reddy, for the next year, you want to grow by 45 to 50%, right? That's what they're looking at. So we're looking at more closely about our numbers, the commitments by customers and all that over the next uh, uh, one month or so. Uh, so we're looking at uh, doing, uh, trying to achieve that and also looking at some new projects. So hopefully we should be there uh, somewhere in the guidance of, uh, you know, 850 to 900 crores. But uh, more or less the lowest, the lowest side of guidance would be around 820, 830 crores is what we're looking at. But the higher side would be about 900 crores. Okay, 830 to 900 crores and margins will hold around 26%? Yeah, we'll be able to do the margins at 26% uh, because this year uh, we did everything possible uh, for the growth uh, what we anticipated, but that didn't happen. But I, I look at it in a positive way because we're able to sustain what we did the previous year in spite of different of shipments and all that. So that's something which, uh, you know, we uh, were able to do it. So moving forward, I think uh, we'll try to do that, as I said, 830 to 900 crores range sort of thing. Mr. Reddy, can you uh, give us some more perspective on what will sort of power this growth, this 900 odd crores that you're hoping to do next year? Which are, which of your segments, where are the orders really trickling in and, you know, where are the, the orders <coughs> fetching you higher margins? No, basically one is the, uh, we're doing, uh, we've done a lot of first articles for a lot of MNCs, as I said, for the aerospace sector. You know, that's something which we are really progressing very well. So those numbers are going to go up much higher. And we are launching uh, some of the, uh, uh, trying to launch some of the new products next year. So these are the areas we're looking at. Clean energy, as far as one of our main customers, uh, we are taking only conservative estimates for the next year as well. So based on that, uh, so that's, we're also trying to achieve a lot of customer diversification over the next one year by doing this. And that's how the growth uh, numbers are coming from. Mm. Uh, these MNC orders that you are in conversation with, uh, what would be the size and when are you likely to close them? See, these MNC orders, we are, see, we are already doing a lot of first articles for them, but the long-term contracts would be finalized within the next couple of months. 
and you're looking at you know uh, some of them would range from 70 uh, 7 million to 10 million a year so, uh, spreading over the next 10 years so these are very long term contracts and can there's only an upside to this and there's no downside so we have we are working with more than two three mncs on this in the first article so hopefully everything will fall in place with the next one one and a half months to complete this Okay, uh, just to talk about the order book, at the end of December, you were just shy of 1,200 crores in terms of total order book size. How are you likely yeah. to end the current year and then what's the projection uh, going forward? See, the one main issue is with the uh, nuclear power corporation, right? We expected 500 crores of orders from uh, through the Tiger 5 and 6 through private bidding. So that got delayed and they're expecting those orders in the first quarter right now. But those numbers are not captured in even our business plan for next year. So that's the only difference. Otherwise, we are on track with that. No, so the guidance that you've given us of 850 to 900 crores, that is including these orders that you just spoke of? No, it's got nothing to do with the nuclear orders, what we're going to get from Tiger Finances. Okay, but uh, and but you're expecting uh, those nuclear orders to come in the first quarter of the new year. Yeah, we are expecting that to be finalized in the first quarter. And what's what's typically the size? Uh, you know, uh, ballpark. What are we talking about here? We're talking about 500 around 500 crores of orders coming in from those two reactors, which is uh, mm. uh, more or less in the clo closure stage right now. Uh, so we'll be instead of instead of getting it before March, probably in the first quarter of next year we'll have it. What about oh. the space segment? How much will it contribute in the coming year? This 830 to 900 crores that you're talking about from the lower to the upper end, how much does space contribute? So that that will be around seats. Uh, space is free issue material, as all of you know. So we're doing we'll be doing around only for ISRO. We'll be doing around 55 crores uh, around that number. The rest will be the aerospace sector is what we're looking at. Okay. Right now, your uh, uh, mix between domestic and exports is, I think, really skewed in favor of exports, right? Uh, if I have the right numbers, nine months, then exports are 74%. Will this mix continue to be more or less the same? Uh, it should be more or less the same. Uh, but from the subsequent year, once the nuclear orders kick in, uh, the progressively the numbers on nuclear will go up. But exports will obviously uh, contribute to about 70 to 75% of our business. And what's the difference in your gross margins between export and domestic? And, you know, you are guiding for margins to improve in FI25. What would the gross margin stand at? See, we're looking at around uh, 50, 50 to 52% uh, is what we're aiming at uh, for next year, mm -hmm. uh, the gross margin. So we take it from there. And obviously, uh, we already have the team in place. Uh, we have the people in place based on the growth, what we anticipated this year. So the next year, we are clearly anticipating, uh, you know, the EBITDA levels of about 26%, plus or minus a few basis points here and there. So that's very clear. And we have been very uh, careful in giving our guidance for the next year as well. So as I said, uh, the lower guidance will be around 820, 830 crores, and the higher guidance will be around 900. So it depends on how things go. Okay, finally, Mr. Reddy, just uh, leave us with uh, a margin profile across your businesses. Like you're getting these big nuclear orders worth 500 crores. So typically, are they high-value orders compared to, let's say, space? And then, you know, typically, where is clean energy in, in in the mix and some of the other segments that you're operating in? Yeah, see, nuclear orders, the difference here is that uh, majority of these orders are all high-value orders where MTA does a lot of projects on an exclusive basis. So as I said, these, uh, the, the NPCL has to finalize with the main, uh, uh, you know, bidder for this. And once that is done, we have quoted for all the bidders. We are exclusively working with them. So these are all very huge orders coming in. And also, we're expecting a lot of refurbishment of reactors going to happen over the next one year. So that will directly come to MTAR as well. So a lot of things. Uh, so these orders, we have not captured for the next year revenue numbers at all. So it will be there in the order book. But by the time we get the orders and the raw materials in place, uh, so all these numbers will move on to the subsequent financial year. Got it. So you'll get a nuclear power thrust as you step into FI25. That is uh, MTR Technologies. Thank you very much for joining in uh, and uh, sharing some of uh, the business uh, sort of contours with us. Remember, guys, this was a stock when Chandrayaan was being launched. Uh, mm. The stock was launched into higher orbit yeah. as well. It was it pretty much hit its peak in about September, I think it was of 2023. And since then, it's petered down because 
you know, the numbers have not looked as good, but what the management is now telling us that, you know, stepping into FY25, things could get a lot better on the top line and on the margin front as well. That is MTAR Technologies. Okay, back to the market then. We have Mitesh, uh, you know, back with us. Mitesh, has turned out to be a, a, you know, a good start at least with a lot of the big stocks firing away. What's, uh, what trading ideas now? So I think it's, you know, the breadth is also very impressive in the last couple of stocks. The bank is also picked up. I have sale as one of the recommendations. Buy here with a stop at 130 for targets of 140. And national aluminum, that's a buy with a stop at about 150 for targets of 160. Okay, 22 150 on the Nifty. The high last week on the Nifty was 22 180. So we are about 30 points away from breaching that level, but it's turned out to be a very strong Wednesday um, you know, morning for us at the day's high. Get into a break. On the other side, we'll get you the latest from the commodity space. Manisha joins us. Welcome back. It's time now to take stock of the commodity markets, how it's opened up. Manisha is now joining in. Manisha, forget the metals, forget crude. <laughs> it's all about chocolate today. It is. You know, I've been doing a bit and pieces here about chocolates and cocoa and sugar and all, but this does command a 10 a.m. link because we have seen the prices run up way too strong at $10,000 a ton. This is more expensive than copper. And, uh, you know, copper is trading at around $9,000 a ton. It's definitely more expensive than where aluminum is trading and zinc is trading and steel is trading and iron ore is trading. So, well, yes, this is one commodity which has just continued to run up and $10,000 a ton has come in too late, too soon is what the markets do believe. So, this is very expensive compared to various other commodities and asset classes from where we look at it. And this is what we've done in sense of prices. In last one week, we've seen 20% gain. In the month of March, it's gained up by 45%. In 2024, until now, it's up 129%. So prices have doubled in 2024 itself, and we are up 230% in last 12 months. So it has been one strong gain that cocoa prices definitely have put out here. This is a very important report from International Cocoa Organization, which says that last year they were dealing with a deficit of 73,000 tons. 
This time around, it is 400% higher in sense of deficit at 374,000 tons. So you are looking at the price jump because of that. And the situation doesn't seem to be getting better going forward. Is the reason every single day, every single week, you have further price rise coming into the market there. When you look at uh, the international access as well, that has been on the weaker side there. The reason that you have seen prices gain is poor harvest in major producing countries like Ivory and Coast and Ghana. I mean, these two countries produce 60% of cocoa in the world. And we are looking at a larger supply deficit in 60 years is the reason the prices have been rising. Crop damages due to weather, disease, aging trees, all of that has been supporting as well. And then when you look at the Ivory Coast crop itself, that is estimated 33% on the lower side at 400,000 tons there. Well, Ivory Coast is going for more rubber rather than cocoa. That is because even as the international market's prices are going higher, Ivory Coast farmers are getting a very fixed price. So if cocoa prices are trading at 400, Ivory Coast farmers are getting only 100 because that is where the prices are fixed. That is a concern and they're not benefiting from this rally here. Also, when you look at the global cocoa market there, in 2019, it was at around 12800 uh, million dollars. It is expected to continue to gain quite strongly at around 1500 million dollars as well. So this market is constantly growing. For the Indian markets, we do produce cocoa, but we import a lion's share of that. So 50,000 tons of dry bean is what we import, which is used in chocolate, liquors, uh, uh, brownies, food, cosmetics, pharma. Also, India has been importing a lot of luxury and premium chocolates as well. So the demand is only increasing. And while, of course, most of these chocolate companies and food companies hedge their buying, but it is not going to be too late that you will start seeing this price rise in many of these commodities. This is very bad news. This is extremely <laughs> inflationary. We must be very concerned with our yeah. budgeting. <laughs> All right, this is quite astounding, huh? but I was thinking uh, too late to be a cocoa farmer. But then you're saying there's anyway, there's not much pricing freedom, so farmers are not benefiting. Not in Ivory Coast. I mean, India has definitely uh, got oh, okay. some pricing freedom. Let, let me go back and, and yes. think of certain... Farming, farming is the way to go. <laughs> All right, Manisha, thank you so much for that. So, cocoa definitely hitting the high notes over there. Also hitting the high notes, by the way, back to the equity markets here, is uh, ABB India, and it is a brokerage call from, I think, UBS. That's working extremely well for this stock. UBS is a very aggressive price target, over 7,500 on ABB India. We've got Vamakshi back in. Vamakshi, the street is really taking note of this particular UBS report. So tell us the details. Well, absolutely. The street is absolutely looking at this uh, report quite bullishly. In fact, UBS says that electrification and motion is expected to drive growth and margins for the company. Uh, the clear focus among some of these global firms such as Siemens and Schneider along with ABB is on capturing the long-term growth in, le in electrification. In fact, uh, ABB particularly is expanding the range as well as the geographical exposure in low to medium voltage products. And in fact, a UBS believes that ABB is one of the best plays on the emerging infra scale up in low medium voltage electrification. As far as the motion segment is concerned, they believe that a step up in order inflow run rate is sustainable on an annual basis. The company is also focusing on expanding its capacity in order to tap in on the growth opportunities and definitely on the back of that, UBS believes that the company will continue to see market share gains. They believe that there is ample scope for ABB to deliver on profitability. They see also believe that there is more upside to consensus on margins despite the recent uh, upgrades that uh, the stock has seen. There are some near-term concerns over the short cycle order fatigue, but there is plenty of scope for the company to uh, scale up its new order growth across both the motion as well as the electrification segments. Going forward, they believe uh, the company could post, uh, They've, in, uh, in fact, they've raised their PAT estimates for 2024 and 2025 by almost 12% and 14% respectively. They've also raised the target price uh, from around 5,380 to 7,550. And this has largely been driven by the raising their target PE from almost 65 times to the historical peak of nearly 75 times. So overall, quite a bullish note coming in on ABB India from UBS. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Get into a break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Rahul Basin, managing partner Bearings Private Equity, to put the focus on divestments, fresh investment trends by private equity players in India. Stay tuned.
Welcome back here with us on Bazaar and it's now time to put the spotlight on the private equity space. There's been a huge pickup in, in deal activity and momentum and a lot of private equity exits is what we're seeing in the listed capital market sphere with PE firms leaving via big, big block trades uh, and also, of course, IPOs. There is a slowdown in fresh private equity investments in the meantime. So talk about a lot of these trends and what lies ahead for the rest of the year. Rahul Basin, Managing Partner at Barring Private Equity Partners, is with us now. Rahul, great to have you on the show. Good morning and thank you for uh, taking out the time. So let's first start with the big block deal party, right? Because we're seeing, you know, promoters cash in. We're seeing a lot of private equity early investors move out as well. Uh, you know, what do you make of things? Because the first point of debate that, that always uh, sort of uh, gets struck is whether this is indicating some sort of a top of valuations or whether this is just a sign of, uh, you know, a maturing, deeper, more liquid secondary uh, listed capital market. What's your sense? I do get a sense that it's a bit of both. Now, if you um, see the private equity industry, the private equity industry takes money for a limited time. Right? It's not like the mutual fund industry, et cetera, where people hold assets forever, effectively, um, as long as you know the investors have money in them. Private equity industry is time-bound. So any investment made, you will see divestments. Um, now, that mode of divestment keeps evolving, keeps changing, uh, depending on market conditions. Sometimes it's strategic, sometimes it's m &A, sometimes it's via buyback. And sometimes it's through the listed markets and the public markets. And you're seeing, you know, one manifestation right now. As far as public markets are concerned, we really are in a Goldilocks kind of scenario right now, right? Every The economy is chugging along uh, the real estate cycle and it's, um, you know, all the sort of, um, I call the derivatives of that are all sort of have revived. Um, interest rates have been fairly modest um, and uh, there has been a huge transfer in the savings habit um, from bank deposits and the mix of savings has moved a lot more towards equity markets uh, in the last decade or so. Now you combine all of these things and you have a very, very um, attractive stock market in one way. Um, and therefore, you know, there's a lot of capacity to um, drive your exits through the public markets. I think that's uh, that's really the um, uh, the question is you know, what's playing out. Do these the Rahul? The question is, do these exits indicate a bit of an interim top? Because PE money is supposedly smart money. Look. Um, I think that what you're seeing is that, uh, you know, post COVID, et cetera, there were no exits possible at that point in time, right? So I think you're seeing a bunching up of exits given timelines of funds. I don't think that there is uh, necessarily a sort of a timing call being made. Uh, that's not the sense I have. I mean, most of the assets which are being sold, if you look at the amount of time they've been held, uh, it would suggest to me that most of these funds are maturing and it's time to return the capital to the investors. Mm. Uh, Mr. Basin, uh, morning. This is Reema here. Now, Bearings has always been very strong when it comes to playing the Indian technology space. In the past, you all held, um, you know, your, you, you all held positions in Emphasis, CoForge. You've exited it now. But what's the view on India Tech? And currently, you know, where is it that you hold stake in? In which companies? Any listed? Which are the unlisted companies? And has your IT portfolio shrunk a bit compared to the past because you have exited some of the large investments? See, look, I think that uh, technology and software. Um, is the world's fastest growing industry. It will stay the fastest growing industry and it will eat up uh, all other industries. I think what people have missed is that it will also eat itself up. Um, and I think that what is happening now is you are going through a phase where um, because of AI and because you know code writing and a lot of work that Indian IT companies were doing, at least on the services side, is now getting automated, there is a very vast increase in productivity which is taking place. Now, 
some of it that has played out so a lot more is going to play out and as that happens i think that you will see uh, that the business models will need to transition and i think that the it industry or the large it service companies i, will, I think that you will see their businesses uh, transform transition and they are at an inflection point at the moment but i think what's more important is that it is now enabling uh, different business models, uh, revolutionary new ways of doing things uh, across all sectors. So you're, you know, you we still play IT and we still play tech in a very major way, uh, but it's not. It's just that which business model you go after uh, has to keep evolving along with market conditions and market situations. Uh, it's not that business any model. services will do badly. It will continue to do well. I don't think that um, anyone, um, you know, anyone except the Indian companies will dominate this space. Uh, but uh, they will go through a transition time. I mean, they will go through a time when, because the enhancement in productivity uh, will lead to lower amount of absolute work if you look at a time and material kind of model. Uh, and... That will, of course, inevitably in the longer term lead to more work and more demand. Uh, but there is a there is an inflection point and a flux, state of flux, which the industry will go through. And I think revenue uncertainty and business model uncertainty for a while. Mm. So you said in technology, uh, it's important to bet at the right kind of on the right kind of business model. You, you know, when it comes to the Indian IT services, as they are going through a transition, it is, and the industry is in a bit of a flux as they adjust to generative AI and all the developments over there. Is it better now from a, you know, what's the private equity way, th way of thinking? Is it safer to now play some of these smaller companies, which are more niche, you know, generative AI, till the, you know, IT services, the large cap companies find their feet? See, look, um, younger companies will always be at the cutting edge. Um, the reason why, why they exist is they're at the cutting edge. Because they're at the cutting edge, they will tend to grow much faster. But technology has a life cycle that, like anything else. Once they start maturing, they'll have to move from technology-centric to customer-centric. Uh, and then they become like the other bigger boys, you know, in terms of how their business model is. Now, the issue is that while they're um, leading with technology and not with customer centricity, you will get very, very high growth up front. And I think that uh, we all as a business tend to chase growth much more. Um, it's a very important driver of returns for us. Now, like I'm saying, um, that's one aspect of it. But if you look at the application of technology or edge technology or you know, satellite technology, or you look at technology as applied to medicine, or you look at technology as is being applied to sustainability, or you look at uh, technology which is uh, being applied to transportation, you're seeing multiplicity of applications of technology which are revolutionizing all kinds of businesses, and the opportunity sets there are massive. In fact, I've made this point earlier, but, um, you know, if you think about it, you know, from 2008, for almost, uh, I think, 12, 13 years, you had almost zero cost of capital around the world. You add the, that to the fact that if you look at the number of scientists, PhDs, engineers working today, they are, that number is more than the cumulative number of the same type of people in the history of mankind. The cumulative total is less than the total today. You juxtapose the zero cost of capital along with this fact. And I think that we have set sure. ourselves up for huge technology revolution. And a lot of it, you're seeing only the early stages of it. I think right. this will continue to play out for at least the next decade. And okay, a lot Rahul, of business models um... will get... Yeah, sorry, sorry, got your point on technology. Actually, we're running a little short on time, so I wanted to quickly get your take on a lot of the other sectors that you have active interest in. Consumer is one such space, and I wanted to sort of understand the thought process because these stocks, at least in the listed universe, they've been testing investors' patience. 
the market has moved on and is looking at uh, you know things like industrials etc and you have some exposure there as well so what do you think of uh, you know consumer and healthcare right now and within industrials are you looking for uh, you know uh, any any newer bets you know what what uh, additionally do you have your eye on now see consumer you know the uh, companies the sort of traditional companies is it companies are fabulous companies right i think the real issue is uh, the challenge of is of valuations uh, if you look at the last 20 25 years the amount of pe re-rating that these companies have undergone uh, it's very intense and you know uh, i i find a lot of bemusement when i see that you know this uh, consumer company was at 80 times earnings now it's at 70 times earnings therefore it's cheap uh, that's i think the fact is that cost of capital was so low that all of this is these companies have got over inflated in one sense right as far as the hiccups in terms of growth one quarter two quarters i think these are hiccups i mean this is uh, these are very sound businesses they will continue to have good good trajectory for the next decade two decades i'm not very sure that they good constitute good investments at this point um i think they're all on the expensive side um as far as industrials etc are concerned look we've not had a proper capex cycle in this country for almost now i think 2011 was the last time you had you know serious capex cycle i think that with the turnaround in real estate um uh, you're seeing now even in hotels you're seeing prices of hotels go up you're seeing hospital utilizations going up uh you're seeing malls getting full again i think you'll see that entire value chain getting investments and infrastructure investments are the government have been, is enabling that and then you will see all the value chains which feed into this i mean mm. if a house gets sold tiles will get sold if tiles get sold durables will get sold soft furnishings sure. will get sold furniture will get sold so you will see a cascading impact of all of this playing out so the environment is very benign in that sense and you know uh, the only challenge mm -hmm. that we all have is that what's not already been discounted yeah fair enough and i think that's where the real debate lies unfortunately we're out of time uh, i would have loved to pursue that question on uh, you know where value still exists but perhaps we'll leave it for another day thanks for joining in great to have uh, some thoughts from you on the subject at hands so that's uh, barring private equity and how they're looking at opportunities in the indian market the market's doing very very well we're leaving the nifty about 140 points higher the mid cap index is also firing away and the bank nifty is leading from the front along with reliance uh, take your leave on the show up next is chartbusters